These are some trying times. But I do believe the Lord is going to help us today to maybe put some things into perspective, if you will. Let us pray. Dear gracious and everlasting Father, we just thank you. We bless you, dear Lord, for this day that you have allowed us to see, this day that you've allowed us to be in. And so as we come to this moment, this time of, of, of bringing of your word, Father, I just pray in the precious name of Jesus that I speak only what you want to have spoken, that I rightly divide your word, dear Lord, that I do not put anything in that is of me, but only the, your truth of what you want your people to hear on this day. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for healing. We thank you for clarity and discernment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a slight deviation from, um, still in the series per se, but we were supposed to continue today, if you will, um, talking about the spiritual gifts. But because of the events that happened on last week, um, the Lord was definitely leading me in a different direction. And so to be obedient to him, uh, we need to address and just talk about what took place and really wanting to put into perspective, if you will, uh, what we have been teaching in the series of setting the house in order. So I don't have a sermon title. I don't have um, that to share with you. But if I had to select a text, um, it will be coming out of Luke, the 12th chapter, and it'll be the first verse. And I'm coming from the NIV version. And this is Jesus speaking to a crowd, but he's also speaking directly to his disciples. And he's giving words of warning, but at the same time, he's giving words of encouragement, if you will. And, the word, and it reads as thus, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were, had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the day daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Let me just repeat that first, second verse. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. And what you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. What we've witnessed on this past week um, and what has been happening in this country um, since the killing of George Floyd up to the historic and unprecedented events of last week. Uh, this morning, we want to try to put those things into perspective, if you will, especially as it lines up with the series that we have been in on setting the house in order. We have been teaching about the Holy Spirit. It's taking us through an examination, and it is a preparation, if you will, for the moral and spiritual outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have been teaching that it's necessary that we must be clear about our identity in Christ because as ambassadors of Christ, we are his representatives and we represent his interests here on earth. We also shared, and this was on last week, that the beginning signs of the birth pains that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 have already begun. Wars and rumors of wars, nations against nations. And we were clear in defining that nations are not only just talking about specific countries, but nations can be groups of people who share the same ideologies and philosophies. And that the scriptures is saying that nations against nations will rise up, kingdoms against kingdoms. False prophets who will deceive many. And Jesus said that all of these things will have to happen, but... The end is not yet. 
So to say the least, last Wednesday was tough to witness. It was hard to witness. It was hard to watch that. And it angered and it frustrated so many of us because it was white privilege at its finest. It was white privilege at its finest. We did see some officers who were trying to fight back and to hold back the crowd. But we also saw some who were removing the barriers and allowing them to come in. We also witnessed that what we saw when the Black Lives Black Matter movement was in place, that somehow, somewhere, that you had enough law enforcement officers who were on guard, protecting the Capitol and everything else, but yet, for some reason, it didn't happen on Wednesday. We saw some of the some officers, instead of helping, were taking selfies with the insurrectionists and even giving directions um, giving directions to them like there was some kind of tour guide as to where to find certain offices. And what we witnessed on Wednesday is the very thing that we as people of color have been marching and protesting against for centuries, that we have no issue with good policing. Our complaint is against those officers who are of the same mindset as the bunch who stormed the Capitol. Not only were there traitors breaking in, but there were some already inside of the Capitol who were carrying the titles of senators and congressmen. A few of my colleagues and I were discussing this incident on last Thursday, and one of them said to me, who happened to be a Caucasian, who said to me that he was so hurt to see white supremacists that were in the Capitol. I had to pause for a minute. My thing was, no, 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 that is not the first time white supremacists have been in the Capitol. White supremacists have always been in the Capitol. They just wore suits and ties. They've always been there. They've sat on the Supreme Court. They've been in the White House, the State House, the School House, and the, and, the, and the Capitol, if you will. They have been, and they're still there. They've been in the Justice Department. They have been in all of our in, um, institutions, and they have been carrying some of the same mindsets, if you will. So it wasn't anything new. They are pastors. They are CEOs. We even find them. They are next door neighbors. So white supremacy just didn't show up on Wednesday. It's been here. It's always been here. In fact, this nation was born with the birth defect of white supremacy and privilege. So now, so so we know, so we know that it came into, that we were birthed with that defect. We know what it's like for so-called liberals to rhetorically renounce racism, yet fall short of any racial or economic justice. So what we observed on Wednesday was not a surprise to us. It was not a surprise to our indigenous fellow Americans who were here in 1492. They've been crying out about it, and we start crying when they brought us here in 1619. So what we saw on Wednesday we told you. We've been telling you what it was like. But it was necessary. Back in September, Minister Kim Harris preached this message. And the title of her message was, it, it, was, it wasn't easy, but it was necessary. And what she was saying in that message, the, the crux of that message, if you will, was that we're going to go through some things sometimes in life that's going to be extremely difficult, but when we get to the end, when we go through the process, we're going to find out that what we went through was absolutely necessary. It wasn't easy watching the Capitol being stormed when we know what would have happened if it had been one of us people of color. It wasn't easy witnessing eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd's life being drained from his body. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. It was necessary for the world to see from a front row advantage with their own eyes the ugliness of racial disparity and justice and injustice. It was necessary for people who had a narrow view or no view of the violence and discrimination against black and brown people, what it looked like. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. 
It was necessary because they have to come to the understanding that we are not in a post-racial society like so many people believe. We are not in a society where racism is not institutionalized like so many people believe. But what happened on Wednesday was an open demonstration to show to the world so that the world has no excuse any longer to hide behind the, the lies and the hypocrisy and the denial of truth and to see in front of them exactly what we've been trying to tell them for centuries. Nobody can escape this stuff now. And what Jesus said to the disciples, and he's saying to them, he's saying to us right now, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. And what happened on Wednesday was a disclosure. And everything that was whispered behind closed doors, Oh, yeah, yeah, now, 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 all of a sudden, we're trying to separate ourselves from 45. Now, all of a sudden, we want to stand up and talk about, oh, no, it was a fair election. No, shut your mouth. You should have said that back in the beginning. You should have nipped it in the bud in the beginning. So, no, 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 we're not going to give you a pass for doing what is right. So, now, you got to pay the price. Now, you got to pay the price. I'm telling you, none of it was easy. None of it was easy, but it was absolutely necessary. It was absolutely necessary because it was important that the world now see what we've been saying. And we knew it was going to come to this because everybody was trying to give it a pass. And it was right in our face on Wednesday. You cannot miss it. I told my daughter two things. This is right before the election, right after election, as a matter of fact. This is right after the, the vote. But Biden had, been, had not been called. because He didn't call. That election wasn't called until that Saturday. And I told her, I said, I would not be surprised if he wins this election by the same electoral vote counts that Trump won. I said, because if it, that, if it happens, that is further verification where God is bringing truth to light. Because you can't say that you won with a landslide yourself back in 2016 with 306 electoral votes and then going to turn around with Biden's 306 electoral votes and say that it wasn't a landslide. Something else that I told her. I said to her after the votes came through and he won, I said, you know what? Clarence Thomas should take one for the team. He should resign so that Biden could put somebody in. Don't be surprised if Clarence Thomas ended up having to resign because sources say it was his wife that paid for 70 to 80 some buses to bring in some insurrectionists. Sounds like to me, we got a conflict of interest. Sounds like to me, somebody might need to step down, if that is true, that somebody might need to move out the way. We're going to hold on to that and put a pin right there because we're just going to wait and see what's going to happen on that one. So now what does all of this mean for you and I as followers of Christ? Because, yeah, we are dis we, we're upset. But I'm here today to tell you, don't be upset. Don't be upset. What does this have to do with what we have been teaching for the last three months? It means that we need to connect the dots, if you will. It means not looking at what is happening around us with tunnel vision. Instead, we must look at the big picture that extends beyond the physical sights and sounds and observe what is happening from a spiritual perspective. We may look at George Floyd's death in disgust, anger, and horror, and we may look at January 6th with the same feelings. But I want to encourage someone out here who may be just a little bit despondent, who may be wondering if God is still on the throne, who may be wondering even where is God. I want you to encourage you that in the midst of all of this chaos, God is truly at work. There are some things that are coming into clarity right now that have been in the shadows for a while and God is bringing it to the forefront.
Because it promised us over in Romans 8 that all things have to work together. They're going to work together for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purposes. So let me just run down for you just really quickly, if you will, what I see that's happening on a spiritual level that's even taking place in front of us from a physical perspective. Let's start by going back with George Floyd in those eight minutes and 46 seconds, if you will. Because I believe those eight minutes and 46 seconds were a Kairos moment. They were a Kairos moment. And let me tell you why I believe that it was a Kairos moment. Because a Kairos moment is God's set time, if you will. It is a moment in time that is outside of the chronological time. It is a time that cannot be measured by a clock. It is a time that cannot be measured by calendars. But it's a time when God brings together and, and completely aligns certain situations and up at a certain time so that it will shift the atmosphere is going to make a paradigm shift. It's going to create something that wasn't there. It can shift toward justice. It can shift toward goodness. And it can shift toward peace. What we saw on, when, on, with, the, with Mike George Floyd was a Kairos moment. It was a Kairos moment because we marched and protested for Freddie Gray. We marched and protested for Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. We marched and prayed when Mother Emanuel uh, Church with the massacre occurred down there in South Carolina. But George Floyd, his death shook the consciousness of white America. Shook it. Shook it. All of the others, no, we got some sympathy. We got some people who came by. But this one, you had a front row seat actually watching this man's life draining from his body. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm not trying to equate it, but I need to bring it down. Who else did we have to stand by and watch his life drain from his body? over 2,000 years ago for something he didn't do, but he died for justice. I'm not saying Floyd is some kind of Christ. Don't get me wrong. I don't want nobody going out to saying that. But what I am saying, that God would use a moment like that to bring attention to an injustice and can stir up. When Jesus died on that cross, they flipped the world right upside down. George Floyd caused protests not only in the U.S., but across the globe. In the midst of a pandemic, you hear what I'm saying here. It woke up and shook the consciousness of white America. It woke them up and then it ignited a racial reckoning that we have not ever seen before. And your mom is getting a brand new name. Uncle Ben is now Ben's original and the skins haven't even bothered about trying to get another name. They're just calling themselves the Washington football team. They're not even trying to go there. I know we can be disheartened by what is going on around us. But we got to look beyond and see and see the hand of God and see what is happening in a spiritual perspective because God is in control and he is orchestrating everything behind the scenes. We have to understand that. I've always said, as we said in scripture, always reminding you, first Christian, and all who may be listening here on the World Wide Web, you may see the person and you may see the circumstance, but you always look to see what is the spirit that is driving that thing. Try the Spirit by the Spirit. Try the Spirit by the Spirit. Now I'm going to bring this on in and just going to bring this up to Biden. Biden ran for president back in 1998 and also in 2008. He never made it to the primaries. Right? In 2016, they were asking him to run. He decided he couldn't run because his son had passed and he was still grieving. He backed out of that race. Not only that, I understand that even in younger Biden, he had suffered an aneurysm that had, could have taken him out. And when reading it, it was saying that the aneurysm that he had, if it had burst on the inside and not burst outwardly, it would have killed him. For some miraculous reason, it didn't burst on the inside, it burst outwardly. For some reason, he did not run and didn't have the opportunity to get to the post where, I mean, to, to get to the, the um, convention and, and to win, um, be nominated, if you will. I am not suggesting, I'm not saying, suggesting that Biden is God's man. I'm not saying that because I don't know that. But I do know that we couldn't take another four years of Trump. And God knew we couldn't do another four years of that. So I believe God's hand was in it. 
Again, especially when he won that, when Biden won that thing by 306 electoral votes. I believe God is in that. I'm not saying it's God's man. I'm saying I believe God is in it. Now let's also talk about what else happened on Wednesday. Because while we were so caught up with what was going on at the nation's capital, as though it was one of the darkest days in the world, there was something else that was happening that was on a historical level, if you will, that was completely opposite of the darkness and disaster that was playing out in front of us. Stacey Abrams, my shero, not only delivered Georgia for the presidency, but this girl right here, she flipped it for not just one Senate seat, but she flipped it to two. This woman right here, who could have used her bitterness and her anger when she was cheated out of the 2018 governor, government's um, race back in Georgia, but instead she took her anger and her frustration, and what she did, she put it to work. She had been working for 10 solid years on correlating and gathering and organizing people so that she could get that state in a position to flip it from red to blue. I just want to say to anyone who's out here that you may be discouraged, you may have been cheated out of something, somebody might have done you wrong, somebody might have lied on you. Listen, don't spend time on trying to, to bring truth to their lies. Don't spend time on having arguments. You know, some things when people say about us, don't dignify it with a response. What you do is get yourself together and you go ahead and continue on the mission that God had called you on because I'm telling you and promising you that God will bring you through it and he will make your enemies your footstool. I just want to remind somebody out there who might be going through right now and you're frustrated because the enemy got you running and you feel like you're backed up at the Red Sea. Stand still and realize that the Lord God Almighty is in control. Look at what's in your hands and begin to operate. Raise up your hands in praise. Give God the glory and the honor. And you're going to walk through that Red Sea and your enemy's going to get caught. So don't get caught up in there. But what that woman did, she flipped it. She flipped that seat. And I know she didn't do it by herself, but of course she had to organize it. And so now that she flipped it, we got two sentences coming in, which is going to help to hopefully that if they act right and do right, because you know God can put you in a position, you can still mess it up. We can't get forward and get all caught up into ourselves, but we got to stay in too. So this is the thing that is so ironic, that while you got all of this white supremacy playing out in front of us in the Capitol, here you got a black Christian and a white Jew going to the Capitol. Tell me God don't have a sense of humor. Tell me. John Ossoff is, 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 is Georgia's first Jewish member to the Senate. He is the first Jewish senator from the deep south. You hear what I'm saying? Since 1879. Now we're going to look over at Reverend Raphael Warnock. Is Georgia's first black American to be elected to the Senate. Georgia's first. He's not the first black American. He's the first black American from Georgia to be elected to the Senate. And now here is the, uh, I, uh, the irony of it. Not only is he a pastor, but he's the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is the church of Martin Luther King, which is the church of John Lewis. Uh, and then not only that, but get this, you remember it was a long time, it was a little while before, before Warnock was really called. He was called before Ossoff. But they were waiting for one city to put everything over. Who was it? It was Atlanta. Atlanta, the cradle of the civil rights movement. So when you start putting all that together, you're not going to tell me. You can believe what you want to believe. But you're not going to tell me that God is not in the mix of that. That was too much orchestrating. I don't, that was not a coincidence what took place right there. Because when you look at that big picture, it has to tell you. That God is up to something. The thing of it is, is we sometimes overlook or dismiss the fact that Jesus is very political. Because there are some folks who don't believe politics and religion should go together. But when it comes to Christianity, you cannot miss that. For the scriptures told us, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government is not man's government, but it is God's government. And God's government is a kingdom. And in God's kingdom and in his government, his world is a world of economic justice, a world of peace, and a world that is not violent. The kingdom has come, but has not come in full fruition yet. 
God is still at work, and we have a job to do as believers. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each of us, and he has given to us specific gifts, and those gifts need to be put into use, and we need to be out speaking truth to justice. It is because of seasons like this and those to come that the Holy Spirit is staring and rekindling the gifts so we can discern the times and know how to navigate through them. For we must observe everything through the lens of Scripture and with a spiritual eye and always look beyond the flesh and discern the spirit beyond the behavior. Jesus said in John 16 and 7, he said, when he, when he, speaking about the comforter, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Our job is to listen to what the Spirit is saying and to move out with all, his, all authority and be encouraged and be encouraged because God is working it out. There was a song um, it's by Car Carletta Vaughn, Bishop Carletta Vaughn, and the song said, there is a flow. It's there is a flow in the Spirit. And she repeats it again. There is a flow in the spirit. And she said, take us into your presence. Teach us to hear and teach us to listen. That's where we are and that's the space we're in now. To hear, no, back up first. To be in his presence. To hear and to listen. Hearing is different from listening. You can hear a sound that's external, but listening is internal. So when you digest it, when you process it, and you react to it, we have to hear the Spirit, but listen to Him. Because in the days that are to come, good days, better days are coming. Might be a little rough getting there. But that's what we have to be prepared for. If you can receive that and accept that, wherever you may are, wherever you may be, let's give the God a praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you because you have a way of settling our hearts and settling our spirits when things all around us are, are of a confusion, when things around us are disturbing. But when we keep our hands in your hands and when we keep our eyes trained on you, you calm us. And let us know that even though we may be going through a storm, that we will come over onto the other side. And so we just want to thank you for that reminder and that thank you, God, for holding us in the palm of your hand as we go through the stormy weather and through, these, through the storms of the sea. We thank you that you're there to guide us and to give us peace and calm. And so now, dear Lord, there's so much that we have to lay before you. We're praying, and as, as Reverend T has already prayed for the leadership of our country, we need to ever be before you, keeping them lifted in prayer. And trusting and knowing that justice will be done. So we just thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to invite anyone who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We would like to invite you to please, we would like for you to call into our church. Or you can inbox us right here um, online. We would like to hear from you. And we would like to share with you the plan of salvation. Even if you're not sure whether or not uh, this, you're not sure. You got questions about Christianity. You got questions about God. We invite you. Please call us. And we will definitely have a minister to call you back and just spend time with you to share God's word with you and, he, and to lead you to salvation should you make that decision that you want to become one with Christ. So you may call us at 410-224-5788. That number will be coming up on your post. Or definitely you can inbox us. So thank you again. God bless you. Until we meet again. Our worship choir.